स्टार्ट या वी आर गोइंग लाइव एंड वेलकम एवरीवन टू द फोर्थ एडिशन ऑफ हेल्थ टेक प्रेजेंटेड टू यू बाय द बंगाल चेंबर ऑफ कॉमर्स एंड इंडस्ट्री एंड मेडिकल सुपर स्पेशलिटी हॉस्पिटल आवर नॉलेज पार्टनर इज पीडब्ल्यूसी एंड दिस प्रोग्राम इज प्रेजेंटेड इन एसोसिएशन विद उडलैंड हॉस्पिटल दिस सेशन इज टेक्नोलॉजी एडॉप्शन इन हेल्थ केयर डिलीवरी ऑन कार्डियो वास्कुलर Dr Robin Chakraborty who is the chairperson of uh, health committee of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and senior vice chairman cardiology services and senior consultant interventional cardiologist medica super specialty hospital he is chairing this session i had request dr chakraborty to introduce the other speakers who are there in the session and take the session forward thank you angana well, good evening um uh, Uh, for this health tech 2021 fourth health tech uh, meeting where basically we are talking about technology in this particular session we are discussing with about technology application and usage in cardiovascular diseases with me uh, this is a great uh, teacher as well as a great uh, a very skilled and accomplished uh, interventional cardiologist uh, dr shubhanand ray our very very favorite dada Uh, we are uh, his guru is our guru actually in interventional cardiology from kolkata he is there he is a director and head of the department of uh, cardiology at fortis hospital kolkata and also dr prakash hajra excellent very promising and very updated interventional cardiologist i would say maybe in entire uh, india today because he travels a lot he does procedure in various parts of india i feel very proud of him and uh, prakash is also the head of the department and director of uh, cardiology of amri hospitals and with me my colleague dr dilip kumar he is director of the cardiovascular cath lab of medica group of hospital he is also going to talk to us on, on another technology and my friend and colleague from bangladesh dhaka dr abdul rahman he is also going to talk on uh, image technology in cardiovascular diseases so with this i think i have a, a, a very short presentation and maybe after that dr shuvan andre then dr abdul rahman and uh, then dr prakash hajra and then dilip kumar i'm sure that the we got about full 1 hour 20 minutes time and during this time we can have a good discussion lot of interaction questions and answers so feel free to talk at any point anybody's presentation if you feel to be interrupted please interrupt and ask questions so that the discussion remains very healthy and progressive as well as very productive and full of knowledge for all of us with that may i uh, start my presentation so uh, my am talking to today to i am talking to do, uh, today on uh, management of pulmonary thromboembolism a new technology which is very important for all of us to understand so modern management of pulmonary thromboembolism and peripheral thromboembolism we know that this is one uh, condition which uh, which always remain always remains under diagnosed many patient they have sudden death people don't know what exactly it is but this is basically thromboembolism incidence of so the incidence is about in india 1 to 2 pulmonary embolism episodes per 1000 people up to 10 per 1000 in the elderly population so as you become old the chances is very high it also could be acute or even chronic pulmonary thromboembolism the problem is that this pulmonary embolism uh, has to be managed because it could be life uh, threatening and this has to be treated in an aggressive manner especially in acute situation the primary mechanism of pulmonary embolism is basically it comes from the vein so we know that veins has got valve is in the directional valve blood comes from the peripheral veins to the right side of the heart and then it uh, the right side of the heart sends blood to lung lung uh, there is exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen oxygen goes uh, carbon dioxide goes out oxygen comes in and then the, the oxygenated blood comes to the left side of the heart and system or body gets this the oxygen oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart so this is a kind of been very short about the circulation of heart so when the blood comes from the peripheral veins the there are valve the valve allows the blood to flow towards the heart so if for some for some reason or other if there is a stasis for a longer time as we all know in the, in the artery blood is it moves very fast but in vein the blood moves slowly and if Uh, somebody sort of you know stands for a longer time somebody travels for a long distance especially even car or even in airplane especially for those people who travel while sitting on in a cross leg position the blood may not flow 
adequately along the vein towards the heart. So there could be stasis of vein and this uh, blood eventually becomes clot, clotted or there is thrombus formation. And for some reason or other, this thrombus may actually slowly move towards the, the heart and from heart it can uh, block the lung arteries. That is what is called pulmonary embolism. Once lung arteries are blocked, blood cannot flow further. There is no oxygen, there is no blood and the blood pressure drops and patient is in acute uh, crisis. It also happens in very special situa situations like patients with hypercoagulability stays, with stasis, with, with venous disease, people with ha having cancers. They are very, and there are certain diseases where they are very prone to get such kind of thrombus formation. So that is what is needed. But the problem is that most of these cases, if there is a very low risk condition, we may remain undiagnosed. We do not even understand it. Some of these patients may have intermediate risk. For example, there is a huge amount of clot that goes to the right side, right ventricle becomes very hypertrophied or even is not working properly. And there is some way to understand that what is the intermediate risk group. High risk is definitely the, when the blood pressure drops. And, and there is a need to support the blood pressure by some medication. And that is what is important. So we need to identify the submassive intermediate risk and high risk group because these group of patients need immediate intervention. Drug actually do not work properly. It helps to some extent, but it actually doesn't take care of the entire volume of blood clot or thrombus formation. We, the cardiologist or intervention people so far, have been using the injection series to suck the, the thrombus back, but it doesn't help. We also tried something called thromboreolytic, thing, some, some, something by which you rotate the thing inside the thrombus, the thrombus gets fragmented and the thrombolytic therapy dissolves those blood clot called thromboreolytic. Then there's a, something like jet. With jet, you actually give the, you break the thrombus, let the thrombus go to different parts of the body in a, in a very minor manner and probably body can take care of that. But it also doesn't help because most, most, most of the time there may be more complication out of this. So nowadays, we can actually have a, a, a mechanism by which we can treat the patient. So conventionally, we are using thrombolytic therapy, like systemic thrombolytic. So many drugs are there. There could be manual aspiration using syringe. Even people have tried with ultrasound guided thrombolysis and the thrombus breakdown. All of these treatments options as far as constraint, restriction, and even, even, even problem. So for example, thrombolytic therapy, long treatment, long hours treatment is required. There could be major bleeding. At the same time, there are many conditions. For example, patient with a history of hemorrhagic stroke, with a history of a bleeding disorder, may not be the right kind of people where thrombolytic therapy can be added. But these people are equally prone to get pulmonary thromboembolism or massive thrombus inside the lung artery or in the peripheral artery. So for them, it is very important to have a device by which you can actually take out those, those thrombus. So especially in acute situation is extremely helpful. So even a syringe-based aspiration also has some kind of constraint. It is it sounds good, but it is difficult because to, to take the thrombus out is not that simple. The syringe vacuum drops to zero in, in mercury in 17 seconds as fluid fills the syringe. When you suck the thrombus, many times what happens from the side of the thrombus, blood may come into the syringe. So thrombus may be there, but may not be adequate. People also tried some, 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 some manual way to suck, but it did not help. So we need to have a system by which you can, you can, you can take the thrombus out. So these days, we actually got a different type of catheter. That catheter can go slowly inside the thrombus and can be taken out. We also tried, for example, in coronary artery, um, all cardiologists, in acute uh, myocardial infarction, acute heart attack, we take a catheter, a very specially designed suction catheter, and we suck the thrombus out. Then we, we try to open the artery and, and dissolve the and, and take the thrombus out. But in a lung clot, where there's a massive uh, thrombus formation, lung artery is very big. Peripheral artery could be big. This uh, technique is not quite satisfactory. So we have to have a bigger device to take this thing out. So Indigo system is a system now indicated for treatment of pulmonary thromboembolism. What exactly happens, there is a bigger size catheter. And then they have to engage the catheter to a thrombus. And then after that, the other end of the catheter has to be connected with a pump, with a, suction, with a, with a negative suction pump by which you slowly advance the catheter with a, with a guide uh, wire and then uh, with, a, with a bit of support and finally reach the uh, thrombus and take it and, and manually 
with negative suction, these are take the thrombus out. It is extremely helpful. Many people are using, and now in India, this has been approved. In our hospital, we also approved it. I'm sure my colleagues of other hospitals are also using it. Prakash Hajra, Dr. Shivanan Ray, I'm sure that they have experience of using this system. This indigo system components, it has got an eight French aspiration catheter. This is the technology. So indigo aspiration catheter needs, so therefore the venous system, we have to put nine or 10 French sheath through which eight French aspiration catheter can go. Then you've got the indigo separators, which you use for heavy thrombus, but in case to unclog the, uh, the C88 or catheter uh, eight under continuous suction. Then there's the engine aspiration pump, which delivers negative suction up to minus 29 millimeter of mercury. Then you've got the engine canister, where which collects the blood and clot. And then there's a tubing, which is indigo aspiration tubing, which gives live feedback of clot and blood and also used to control the blood clot. So these are the five sort of component of this uh, indigo system or technology, which is extremely helpful in, in, in uh, aspiration of the thrombus by, by negative suction and extremely helpful. So this is what is the Penamra engine aspiration pump. This is the pump. At this end, you can connect the catheter. One touch for maximum aspiration is a powerful deep vacuum minus 29 millimeter marker. You see, is the suction uh, ability. It's easy to set up. It's not a difficult job. And then connect with the catheter. And the catheter goes like a conventional sort of femoral vein puncture. And then you take the, the catheter uh, inside, the catheter lumen inside the thrombus over a support wire. And then you... You, you deliver the catheter. This is the technique which is being shown in a peripheral artery embolism. You can see that what exactly happens. <clears throat> so this is that uh, yeah, a kind of a uh, cartoon where video where you can see there is a blood clot in the thrombus or the thrombus in the peripheral artery, the big artery. So yet inserting the catheter this is a 10 French sheath. You're doing, uh, taking a 8 French catheter. Insert the femoral vein. <clears throat> so that is the femoral vein. You can see the blood clot there. That is the wire. And then you slowly advance it. And then gradually, then, yeah, they, uh, once it goes, then take this is the catheter, each French catheter, indigo catheter, take it gradually towards the thrombus. This is the thrombus, huge thrombus blocking the entire vein. The same thing can be done even in the peripheral artery. Now, slowly, slowly, this, this is goes, this comes in. And finally, it will be taken out. So from the vein, even this, this may be an artery, from that you slowly the thrombus button comes out. So this is the technique by which it is being done. Renarrowing of the arteries after the um, uh, rotational atherectomy. And uh, again, that came as a very important tool when with some modification of the technique uh, happened. And we call it plaque modification. And in the year 2000 and, uh, 2005 onwards, there is a huge uh, resurface and resurgent of the, uh, resurgence of the procedure uh, of rotational atherectomy, particularly of the calcium laden arteries. Now, why uh, the calcium laden arteries are important? You can see this uh, cartoon of a normal coronary, coronary artery, which is a very elastic uh, art, uh, and tube. And uh, this tube has got three layers. The layer, which is the conductive layer, that means through which the blood flow happens, is no, just like a non-sticking frying pan. The blood uh, uh, components move through this channel, but did, uh, does not, these components do not Touch the, uh, they touch the uh, surface, but do not get attached to the surface. And once there is a lesion 
on once there is a uh, abrasion on this layer the blood component stick there forms a clog and blocks the artery that is the mechanism of a coronary heart attack so what happens from the young age gradually the lipids and other deposits cholesterol deposits they dep deposit between the two layers of the uh, uh, artery or the tube and they gradually narrow down the artery and this becomes the formation of a coronary artery lesion or coronary artery stenosis now when calcium deposits on these layers it becomes very stiff and just like this you see that this is a tunnel which is made up made of rocks and this tunnel when there there is there the rocks are uh, within it gradually the tunnel becomes sluggish to for the some flow and there are the, the you see the sepals growing and these are the you know clots and other uh, fibrosis uh, sets in and gradually the tunnel closes now what we do in angioplasty we, in a, no, a normal angioplasty we compress the plaque with a balloon and put a guard wear which is called stent uh, uh, on it and so that the blood flow becomes optimum but when there is calcium it becomes very difficult to crack and we need to crack the calcium so that ultimately we get, get a caliber like this you can see the tunnel after stenting it is just like a beautiful tunnel tunnel through which the blood can move easily so to get it we need something which ca which can crack the calcium which can reduce the calcium to the calcium load so that the you know balloons and other systems work on it and make the uh, tunnel rounded and wide now this is the cartoon which shows how a rota works you can see a bullet shaped uh, metal bullet which is uh, going across the uh, calcified narrowed part of the tunnel and through it and when it goes through the through the uh, narrow narrowest part of the tunnel gradually the uh, uh, calcium is broken and the cavity is widened so how it how it is done it is done by this bullet which is uh, uh, shown in a more clarified way and you can see it has got two parts one is the uh, forward part one and another is the backward part the forward part is studded with diamond crystals and these diamond crystals act as a cutting edge and when this bullet rotates in a very high rotation like 150000 to 2 lakh uh, rotations per minute then it crosses uh, it uh, you know crushes the calcium layers of the artery and pulverizes it and these pulverized particles and micro particles which is the size of a well, less than 5 microns and they are taken up by the reticulo endothelial cells cells of the system and thereby is washed away from the arteries so ultimately after the rotational arterectomy we get a wide uh, artery without any debris the debris is taken care of by the reticulo endothelial cells of the system now you can ask me why there is uh, why the, there is so much of rotation of the bullet why do, doesn't it uh, ha harm the normal elastic portion of the artery it is just we call it a differential cutting as if when we shave we see that when you uh, uh, pull the blade it cuts the dry i mean in a inelastic surface but the elastic surface removes the blade from uh, doing harm to the elastic surface they, they just push the bl blades away and that is the uh, mechanism of why a uh, rotated uh, metal bullet in of rotational arterectomy while it is rotating inside a coronary artery is does not harm the normal elastic portion of the artery rather it cracks the calcium or inelastic inelastic part of the artery uh, uh, through its movement so 
again why how it moves when you you have those who do angioplasty have seen that when you try to push a balloon it becomes absolutely difficult to push the balloon but when you rotate the bar as if when you are opening a champagne bottle by uh, rotating the cork and you know that if you try to pull out the cork it will be very very difficult but if you rotate and come out it will be open easily so just like that when a rotational atherectomy bar uh, we we call the bullet as a bar and when the rotational atherectomy bar moves rotates in a very high speed and that uh, You know, displaces the orthogonal uh, 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 displaces the friction orthogonally and reduces the friction so in rotation lathrectomy the friction rate is reduced now what is a system and you can see the we have a system where there is an advancer and you see that the part of the advancer is the metal bullet which is called a bar and bar is connected to a uh, uh, advancer with and the advancer has got a knob which when you move the knob the uh, you know mm, metal bullet goes forward and backwards and this is the console and this console has got two uh, systems in one is the air pressure which is delivered from the you can see the lower part uh, lower picture is delivered from a uh, compressed air system and that mechanical uh, that air pressure moves the bar mechanically and there is an electrical system which shows the bar movement exactly what rotation is there and exactly where, where, what uh, uh, time has elapsed so every rotation when we start rotation lathrectomy we fix up the rotation rotation like Mm, like one lakh fifty thousand, and we see that whether there is a drop of rotation. That means if the ro ro drop of rotation is more, the bar may be stalled. And we also see how much time has elapsed. Otherwise, there will be heating of the system, and there will be you know burning, and there will be injury to the vessel wall. So with that. and this is the air supply as i as i told you initially we used to use ni uh, liquid nitrogen and you can we sometimes we use now it is we use compressed air now as i have said this rotational atherectomy bullet or a bar is moved on a wire which is called rotational atherectomy flow wire this type of uh, and this bar as it moves on the rotational atherectomy wire it does not deviate too much so that it does not harm the arteries so it goes along it uh, in just like a tram it goes along the tram line or the uh, uh, along the uh, you know where on which is it is going so that helps the bar to move around and uh, without any uh, asymmetrical movement so there are two types of wares we use these are stainless steel wares we call rota floppy ware where the tip is floppy and this is this can can be negotiated through the uh, you know tortuous vessels and also a rota extra support wear where it 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 is very stiff and uh, it it is used in places where there is a gap between the catheter and the uh, artery to breach that area as for example the ostial lesions of the arteries so this is an extra support wear after that when with the ablation of the plug burden less pressure is required for the balloon why i am i am showing this because initially i told you when uh, david ot introduced the system it went into oblivion because we we uh, thought of debulking or maximal uh, removal of the calcium but now it is we do not believe in this we just do plug modification so that we take a smaller bar we crack the calcium and so crack the calcium in such a way that say less pressure is required for a balloon expansion so we do half we uh, we do the uh, job by a rotation lathrectomy and the other half we do with a balloon and put a stent across and that has reduced the restenosis rate from 30% to nearly like less than 5 uh, 5% 6% and that is the uh, and with the advent of newer drug eluting stents we have a wonderful uh, resurgence of the technique so when you do a rotational lathrectomy 
you have to remember few points these are mostly for uh, for the uh, clinicians that is number one is a bar position number two how, whether you have locked the system how you advance whether you you can advance easily whether whether you can release really uh, easily and what would be the bar speed these five points should be remembered the key process procedural step step is to put the um, uh, uh, first to put the wire in rota floppy or rota extra support in then you put the guide uh, rota rotation lathe to be bar in then you fix up the rotation and rotation to uh, what you uh, suggest and then you maintain that and so that there is no no jump less than uh, 50000 of rpm if the rpm is i told you that when the rpm drops down below 5000 there is a chance of stalling of the bar so avoid it and up uh, and particularly we, and uh, um, total rotational pr procedure should not be more than 5 minutes and with that we know that there is a this is the wonderful device and in most of the cases and rotational arthroscopy is the first device to be used the another device which is which has come recently that is called orbital arthroscopy as we know the rotational arthroscopy has got a problem that the rotational the achilles heel of rotational arthroscopy is the wear of uh rotational arthroscopy and this wear is so flimsy that if there is a kink the bar may be stalled so that to circumvent this we came with another another device which is called orbital arthroscopy which has a beautiful wear inside and which is strong wear and this uh, uh, um device is just like a uh, ring on your index finger and this ring Uh, and and your finger if you move move in a orbit and in a oblique way it acts as a jackhammer and strikes the calcium and breaks it so it there are two important points the rotational arthroscopy it moves around and there is a rotation and in the orbital arthroscopy it moves in an oblique way and it acts as a jackhammer and here the uh microns or the particles are larger it is around 10 microns whereas in uh, rotational arthroscopy in ideal cases the my, uh, you know uh, pulverized particles are much less that is less than 5 microns so you, you can see this and this is a uh, index finger with a ring and this finger when it moves in an oblique way it acts as a jackhammer and breaks the calcium so the last is another technology which is called uh um, the shock wave lithotripsy and here there is a balloon which uh, gives uh, shock waves and which behaves as a very high pressure and uh, that is that is a, uh, around 50 atmosphere pressure uh, during the during its initial i mean during its functioning and that can crack the calcium i i think some somebody would be talking of it uh, elaborately so i am not going into the details and <coughs> now if you image the artery you will see that calcium may be deposited in three ways if there is a very thick cap and mostly the non luminal calcification you can use traditional techniques like nc balloon scoring balloon cutting balloon there are different types of balloons and on top of that you can use an ivl or inter intravascular lithotripsy which can deliver high, very high pressure by giving uh, by producing shock waves and that can break the calcium all over so this is the indication of most of the techniques now if there is a promontory of calcium in one side and other sides are relatively free there you have to go with a um, arthroscopy device or ablative technique like rotational arthroscopy or orbital arthroscopy i must say when there is a promontory of calcium it is the rotational arthroscopy is the you know treatment of choice and if there is an uh, deep and uh, deep calcium thick calcium there the to start with it is better to have a either a ablative procedure either of the ablative procedure like rota or uh, uh, or orbital and on top of that you may need you may need something either a balloon or an ideal technique so of the three te techniques rotational arthroscopy is the oldest and most preferred why reasons can be done in all cases because we know that ability uh, other ability therapy like uh, orbital cannot be done in all cases and lithotripsy also cannot be done in all cases but rotational arthroscopy can be done in all cases it is a known devil for the last 30 years so we know how to use it and what are its complications uh, 
In an expert hand, a newer modification of the use, as I have told you, that the new resurrection, what happened after the modification of the you know, use and plaque modification with, and with second generation stent implantation, the MACE rate or major advanced cardiac event rates reduced to less than, uh, in a single digit, reduced uh, less than 10%. And this is our paper, which has been published in uh, AJC recently. That is the percutaneous intervention of severe and moderately calcified coronary artery lesions. We use a single bar. This is our technique. And it showed that there is a significant reduction of the MACE rate and less than 10%. And, and we could achieve this in a three-year follow-up. And we have done all complex cases of like left main bifurcation CTO with equal success rate and uh, with rotational lathectomy. So rotational lathectomy was there. It is there also and will be there in future. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Roy. That was a wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation. I think I must say it is exceptionally great presentation. I have some questions. I'm sure that many of us will have uh, more questions. So, may I, so I think it may be a good idea to take or collect all the questions and discuss it later on. Meanwhile, may I request Dr. Abdul Rahman to make his presentation. Dr. Shwanra, that was great. Wonderful. Again, you are my Gurudev. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we'll discuss. Love about, I got something, some more thing to learn. Dr. Abdul Rahman. Abdul, can you? Uh, yeah, you're there. Yes, I am on the screen. Is your screen? Excellent. Share your screen and. Nice to see you, Abdul. Yes, thank you, sir. That is a great talk, I think so. That is a great talk. Excellent talk. Excellent. Uh, but after that, I'll give something as I understand that this is not really the participant is an interventional cardiologist, maybe some of the general people was there. Yes. So I have focused on talk accordingly. I think it was a wonderful presentation by Dr. Shubhanara. Very nice. Shubhanara, so wonderful presentation. Your presentation also is good. But after the presentation, I'm really shaky to give my presentation. No, no, you do, and, you do a good job. Dr. Abdul Rahman is the father of modern cardiology of Bangladesh. Dr. Abdul Rahman, all. Okay, thank you very much. It is really honor for Robin. Robin, for thank you for inviting me and all of the people that is on the board. They are a really good friend to me. And my talk is that the imaging technology of the coronary artery intervention. This is very important topics. So what are the imaging for the coronary artery? You know everybody that for the imaging and for the intervention, we depend on the angiogram. That is resolution is 100, 200. I was the resolution 80 to 120 and also radio frequency I was or OCT. These are the uh, imaging technologies that we are using in our uh, intervention procedures. And uh, angiogram is a luminogram, but uh, surface tomogram and surface tomogram, all of these OCT and I was. On the other hand, it is a contrast angiography that is a luminogram that is angiogram. So this is the coronary anatomy. We are using, uh, we are seeing the coronary, right coronary, you know, right, we can see this is right coronary and the branches, and this is the left side, that is LED and the also LCX. And this is all of the branches. And this is the angiogram. So what happened with the angiogram? It is extensively used. It is the gold standard and visualized intercoronary, identify the disease, helpful in clinical decision making, lesion, estimation and pathway to intervention and that's all but the limitation is that angiogram what you seeing that is we are seeing from the outside not inside what is exactly inside this coronary we are not seeing it and this is that this is the picture uh, you are seeing that this picture we are seeing from the outside only but when we exposed it you can see that the lot of the fruits is in the basket. But before that, only we are seeing in the basket. So this is the limitation of the angiogram. And that's why the coronary imaging and physiology is coming to, for intervention of the coronary arteries and new intervention technologies, clinical imperative, newer technology, 
evidence-based validation, whether we have, and widespread application. That is most important in the new internet technology, either OCT or FFR or IBUS. And wh what is the advantage of IBUS? We, we can see that the, in the IBUS, we can see that inside the coronary arteries, in view from within the vessel, angiogram, we're seeing, being, uh, seeing the coronary artery from outside. Here, we being the inside the coronary like this. And what is the advantage of the IBUS in OCT? Accurate visualization of the coronary artery, analysis of the plaque composition, distribution, vessel, and lumen geometry, Identif identified dissection and stent apposition and virtual histology. These are the things we can uh, we can uh, add it during coronary intervention, during coronary intervention, beside on the top of the angiogram. So why it is coming up, we, we can see that it is a nicely picture that uh, in the angiogram, it shows that there is a tight lesion in the ostium of the LED. And this patient was had undergone two times bypass surgery and both of the bypass graft lima was closed. Then I was done. They showed that none of the basal, that is the upper and lower late main is not diseased. So in, especially in the late main, the coronary artery underestimate and it, it only possible of um, uh, um, solve this problem by the IVAS. And and what is IVAS? IVAS is ultrasound that is given from the transducer. And this ultrasound goes to the wall of the vessel. And that is reflected and received. You can see that the, the transducer being the ultrasound that is going to tissue. And this back and received by the texture. And it is displayed in the monitor. And like this, this is the vessel. You can see that the C the, the, the lumen of the vessel can be visualized. So it is an ultrasound based. And this is that the postron is producing mechanical and um, uh, mechanical one. You can see that the uh, four MAZ now it is coming up with that the uh, 60 AZ is also coming up. That is more visualization of the coronary artery. And this is the IVAS card system. We can see that it's portable. It is just like an eco machine. And it is, as I mentioned, that the sound is uh, given to the tissue and for the tissue is reflected and displayed in the monitor. You can see the, exactly what is inside the coronary arteries. And I was guided the PCI indication and when I was used, decide strategy and sizing. That is, we can properly size the coronary anatomy and we can properly sizing the coronary vessel. And also the reference and personal stenosis and also the IVAS evaluation that is post stent after post in, in stent implantation, how it is deployed. And we can see that the image resolution, we can see that this is the coronary and artery, this is the lumen, and you can see that this is the intima, this is the media, this is the adventitia, and there is a plug is here. And this is the high resolution, and you can see this histopathology, and we can see that the, clearly we can see that the um, uh, clearly we visualize the coronary anatomy. This is the three layer. We can see that the intima, media, and also adventitia by IVAS. Amazing. That cannot be done by coronary angiogram. And you can see that the image of the coronary artery, adventitia, media, and intima, if we display it widely. And you can see that the disease coronary, how it looks like that. This is the intima, and this is the lumen. And you can see that this is a plaque, intima plaque, and this is the media, and this is the adventitia. And also we can see the plaque composition. We Everybody knows that everybody is not the same, and every plaque is not the same, like a guard. It is also like that. For a human coronary atherosclerotic plaque is not the same. It could be fibrous plaque. It is like whitish one is a fibrous plaque. So by uh, IVAS, we can see the fibrous plaque. And also you can see that the that is short plaque, that is hypoecogenic. You can see that less density than it is called the attenuated plaque or lipid core within the plaque. You can see that. And also attenuated plaque is there. 
And also Shubhanan Rai nicely elaborately described that we can, by IWAS, we can see that the this white is, that is, that is the calcium. This is the culprit of the coronary intervention, especially when we uh, deploy the stent. And we can also see the distribution of the calcium, where the calcium is. This one is the deeper calcium that is away from the lumen. And this is superficial calcium. This is towards the lumen. We can see it by the IVAS. And this calcium is very dangerous. If we cannot see it earlier, then the stent will not be uh, opposed to the coronary artery and there is a malopposition and also there will, um, uh, then uh, is subsequently the patient develop instant stenosis and also stent thrombosis. And this one is a superficial and deep calcium that indicate that it is also present uh, towards the lumen as well as the uh, away from the lumen. This is combination of the superficial. This is the deep calcium and this is the superficial calcium and this is the T. This is not too much dangerous, but this superficial calcium and super deep calcium, both of them are very much um, dangerous during the coronary intervention. Calcium plaque, I will not spend more time. And you can see that you also we can see how far it is the circumferentially, whether it is. And you can see that it, this is one of the coronary artery where the stent was implanted. You can see that the stent fully opposed stent. You can see that the stent start is there, start is there. But here what happened that the stent is there is at the above side, but on the downside, the stent is not opposed. This is the lumen. So it is incompletely opposed stent. So we can identify this and we can deploy this stent properly by giving more bigger size balloon. And stent is heavily calcified lesion. You can see that the, the calcium is heavily calcified. And if we don't dilute, prepare the lesion properly, and uh, Dr. Shubhanara uh, told that, then the stent will, uh, stent will not be opposed and then it's heavily calcified. And this calcium has, be, has to be cracked by um, rota or other devices. And this is the OCT machine. We can see that the, they use the light actually. The IVAS uses the ultrasound. They use the light. And, uh, and uh, we can see the intima more delineately than the IVAS. We can see resolution is 15 microgram, OCT 15 microgram. And, uh, and uh, IVAS is 100. And penetration is 2 millimeter. That is, uh, we can uh, see. We cannot see the deeper structure here. Penetration is ten, and so and also that is uh, and uh, penetration for penetration here blood has to be cleared. That is the limitation. But here there is no limitation of the blood. This blood has to be cleared usually by the dye injection. But here it does not requires. But uh, the thing is that if you want to clearly identify the intima, that OCT is more. Uh, useful than I was. It is the it is just like a picture of like this, and we can see that the here, the intima, intima media and adventitia is clearly can be demonstrated, but on the I was, it is not like this. So if we want to see the intima properly, if we see the um, I was catheter is. Opposed properly and clearly, then it is, it, it is intim, uh, OCT, maybe the better uh, than I was. And intimal dissection is also more than dissected by, uh, can be demonstrated by the OCT, but, but the, there is a less data than I was. I was has a more robust data in the clinical trial than the, than the OCT. And this is the picture you can see that. This will nicely demonstrated that you can see here clearly. So what is this? What is the? This is the coronary angiogramic structure. This is the OCT. And if we see picture side by side in the OCT, we can see that um, it is uh, there is structure, internal structure. That intima media intima is nicely seen in the case of the OCT. But uh, here I was, you can see some blurring of the vision, and there is some kind of the shadow that maybe. Uh, may cause the limitation of interpretation of the 
IBUS, uh, um, IBUS images. That is a limitation of the IBUS, but IBUS has a robust data and most useful and more um, more um, and uh, you can use for all of the patient, but OCT cannot be used in the, uh, maybe difficult to use in the setting of the special renal failure patients. And also the in our subset, the IBUS is less expensive than OCT. So expense is a big factor for that. But both of the devices is used, but not really penetrating. In the USA, only 80% of the penetration is by the imaging technique. And in Japan, as everything is covered with insurance, their penetration is more than 90%. In Asian country, maybe in Bangladesh, we, I will say that less than 5%, even only maybe I will say that 1% to 2% penetration of the um, uh, IBUS and OCT far, far less like this. Now, this is the coronary anatomy. We can see that the intercoronary imaging anatomy or functional assessment, that is physiology. Another important is the physiology. And improvement assessment of this coronary uh, lesion, fractional for reserve, if ever, accurately assessment of the hemodynamic significance. Sometimes if the lesion is intermediate, if the lesion is more than 90%, then can, you can depend on the coronary angiography finding. But the, if the lesion is less than 90 and intermediary, then it is very difficult to predict whether the lesion is significant or not. That's why FFR is introduced. FFR is very important tool and FFR has is class 1A indication in the setting of the assessment of the intermediate lesion. But IVAS OCT is still class 2 indication. So that's why the indication wise in ACC and ESC, uh, FFR IVAS class 1 indication in the intermediate lesion and multiple um, uh, coronary diseases, but IVAS and OCT, the still uh, indication is class 2A, and especially it is recommended only in the complex subset of the patient, either left main or refractional lesion or CTO or calcified lesion. Now, anatomy versus physiology, two clinical setting is PCA indicated. That has to confirm. That is important. That is indicated. And technical aspect of the PCA, that is characteristics of the lesion, is the PCA is, result is optimum. That is also the question has to be. And this is the FFR. We can see that this is the narrowing of the vessel. And this is the distal pressure and the proximal pressure. And the difference is the uh, the the. Proximal, uh, proximal distal pressure, and um, uh, that is that is pro that is pressure distally, uh, and uh, uh, and pressure proximally. Then uh, the we calculated it FFR, and if FFR is 0.8 or more, then it's normal. If FFR is 0.7 or less, then it is ischemic. Now we can see that if the FFR is less than 0.8, then this patient can be deal has to be treated by stent implantation. But the FFR is more than eight, we can treat the patient medically. And the if the stent is used, then this is harmful. This is class, this is, that is harmful. That's why FFR is very useful, especially in the setting of the uh, intermediate additions. And this is the devices we are using that. And in FFR, adenosine is required to produce hyper, uh, hyperemia. But in IFR, there is another device is that the hyperemia is not reduced, but most of the time we're using the FFR. You can see the adenosine either in the bolus or IV drip. And you can see this is one of the pictures. Here are two lesions. Two, one is the proximal, one is the uh, after that. And here the FFR is 0.65. That indicates it's significant. And, but in A, the, there is lesion, but here this FFR is Point one that it is not significant. So this portion has to be stented. And we can see that the angiographically, the OM lesion, this is branch of the circumflexion, is very tight. And everybody will say that this lesion has to be stented. But when if are done, if is 0.88, that indicates it is not significant. But if we depend only on the angiogram and do the PCI of Saskam lesion, then it will be the overtreated. So FFR is useful tools. Please use it when it is indicated. And this is the lesion, one of the RC lesion, if it is 0.84. And so 
we can say when and how to use the imaging and physiology. That is the question. Okay. Now that I have all of this tool, new imaging and physiology technology, how can I develop rational use algorithm to help optimize the PC outcome? We cannot use the imaging like in Japan for everybody in our subset of the patients. But we have to know that which patient we have to do the imaging and also, we have to know the when we have to use the FFR. That is very important, especially in the multivessel disease, especially in the, uh, in the intermediate lesion. We have to do the um, FFR estimation before putting a stent. Exactly, if we do the left main lesion, evaluate the left main, we, we have to depend on the IVAS to detect the, how the coronary lesion is. Sometimes it is underestimated, sometimes it is overestimated. So, ladies and gentlemen, with this, uh, I, have, I have concluded my presentation and thank you again. So dream will come true. When we use that every modality is, every modality is properly. Thank you, Abzalu. That was really wonderful presentation and very appropriate for a health tech meeting of uh, our Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry because uh, I'm sure that people who are listening to this talk now can understand that how we, the interventional cardiologists, are using very advanced technologies in the treatment of complex heart diseases for our patients in a very skillful manner. All, all of us, my colleagues and everyone today, is very skilled uh, to have used these technologies for uh, bringing a good health, good heart for their patient. So uh, we'll have some questions later on. May I discuss? May I call now uh, Dr. Prakash Hajra to uh, present to us his talk. Dr. Prakash Haji is an upcoming extremely updated uh, interventional cardiologist from of India. And uh, he uh, comes from our, our AMRI Hospital, is the director and head of the department. I'm sure, sure that you know, he is the talk will be extremely uh, useful for all of us. Dr. Hajra, please. So uh, thank you, Ravinda, for introducing me. Today's talk will be absolutely away from my specialty and skill, a new skill, prostate artery embolization, catheter-based angioplasty for the benign hypertrophy of prostate. We in AMRI, as a team, uh, we believe and we do different things. And we also do things differently. And just because our motto is to bring innovation in Eastern part of India. And uh, to do that, you have to go back into the history. In the history, you have many things which was done, like uh, angiography, catheter 1854. Then we moved with new technology, PTC in 1977. Then first a knifeless a valve replacement in 2002 by Alan Krivier. Then in 2020, what uh, just recently we discussed is intervascular lithotripsy or shock wave therapy has been introduced for the first time in India in 2020. And also in the history, we have seen there are many legends, many, many legends, they are still alive and they are luminaries and they have brought this new technology, new technique like angiography, ablation, CATs, uh, the, the, the impilla, then your uh, Somaraju stent in Indian scenario to help people at economic and at uh, very economic cost. So these are the testimony of first few things which happened in my hospital uh, for TAVI, for artificial heart, for wireless pacemaker, then uh, for obesity, angioplasty, then the micro pacemaker, etc., etc. And there are many concepts for the first time originated uh, from my uh, hospital. This is kind of uh, not, not an arrogant uh, uh, statement, but just to make aware the Bengal Chamber of Commerce, the honored organizations about the first renal denervation originated in India from our uh, center, Tavar, LA Closer. And uh, PAE is also for the first time in eastern part of India. And this concept, you know, is like, uh, is, you know, when you have a neuron, and uh, when it dies with uh, ischemia or stroke, it becomes a dust. And similarly, the cardiac muscle, cardiac cell, when they die, they lose the whole integrity of the cells. And this is instant and cannot be reversed. 
Similarly, in the prostate, you have prosthetic cells which grow in size with time. And once you kill them with uh, PVA particle, they die forever. They usually do not regenerate. And this is the concept, and this is the first man to have their prostate artery embolations. And he himself came for embolations after social media propaganda, and we offered that. Now, when I got a patient of my own, 78 years male, developed massive bleeding hematuria, uh, pariurethra, just after having an angioplasty done his left main. And nobody was willing to operate. Nobody was willing to operate on him because there is a high risk of death during anesthesia, like TRP or HOLA, which is done under spinal anesthesia or in general anesthesia with ventilations. So high morbidity, high mortality. Then I search the literature that PA is done and maybe very safe procedure in many of these people who bleed, there's a large prostate, catheter light, and it improves the symptom instantly on the table. And this concept came from Portugal. Now world over, there are more than 10,000 patients who has benefited from this embolization procedure which we do the best because we know how to handle the catheter, how to do the angiography. So this is a pelvic organ, and this organ progressively enlarges with time. And if you do the prostate artery embolations, it immediately shrinks. The complication rate is almost negligible. Nobody has died out of my 26 patients in last one year. And, you know, there are a lot of data in China 2014, Switzerland 2018, Spain 2020, so this is proved therapy and is not as a class one therapy because of obvious reason, because these patients are not being referred by urologists. If they start referring these patients for, for prostate artery emulations, probably they lose their bread and butter. And you know, it is so obvious now that in sham control trial, like you do an angiography, don't do anything on the prostatic artery, and you have a separate group like RDN hypertension trial, this very famous trial, SHAM control trial in hypertension. And this has proved that even in SHAM, there is no benefit in prostatic symptoms, hesitancy, retentions, bladder light, voiding, the jet of urine in male versus SHAM. So it is beyond any doubt that it works and definitely works on the very first hour, very first day, very first month and very first year. Uterus versus prostate, uh, you know, this in, in female, you have uterus and the ovaries. As you grow old, your uterus size shrinks, whereas fortunately, uh, the prostatic growth is slow, but with aging, the prostate becomes large and large. And this large prostate can give rise to many urinary symptoms. So if you go for reverse aging concept, the prostate should remain as small as possible and uterus should remain as large as possible throughout their life so that the female can conceive again and men are relieved of prostatic symptoms. Now, in this cartoon, I have shown that by catheter, you pass a small micro catheter in the very small minute arteries of the prostate and you inject alcohol particle and you instantly kill those prostatic cells and the prostate becomes smaller the next morning, if they go home next morning without anesthesia, without knife, without stitches, without blood, without infections, without any ejaculatory problem, which usually we face in prosthetic surgery. Now, in heart, you know, this cholesterol uh, artery gets, gets larger and larger with time, and one day it ruptures that causes heart attack. Similarly, in the prostate, it enlarges, and one day it bleeds profusely, you get hematuria. As then you go to a urologist, he asks for surgery. But if you have come to me, I would suggest that in all prostatic hypertrophy, there's one instant relief that is catheter based or angioplasty based embolizations, which we do for bleeding GI, bleeding uterus, or bleeding breasts. 
CCM therapy we deliver energy during from an pacemaker to the heart and this generator is visible CCM and is a permanent is and continuous during one hour whereas in in prostate this is one time procedure CCM and you do, don't see anything left behind like a stain like a pacemaker like a wear like a coil in your body we just inject a glue which gets embolized instantly on x-ray and that is through a five french catheter and this catheter is smaller than link pen tip and this is one of the procedure mr chiranjeev roy 88 years male amri i think this was done way back last year and we inject through this very tiny catheter in a very very tiny vessel which is almost 100 times lesser than heart artery sizes so imagine this small arteries goes into the prostate bladder rectum penis and smaller organs you have to go very selectively and this is not a rocket science to understand that if the arteries are small your catheter your device your particles should be smaller so it is in micron size and we can embolize instantly it can compete it can be complementary it can be competitive can be superior to many holap qrp because of ease of doing very small learning curve maybe one or two cases you do as an angioplasty or a radiologist you can learn this prostatic angioplasty does not re- require any blood whereas in laser very very costly very stiff learning curve and you get a lot of complications so it's time ladies and gentlemen technique and technology both are advancing sometimes we need to have both and you know when you talk about this technique first time many people they don't believe but when you say that it gives instant quality of life people will be happy to accept that so need lot of narratives discussions and dispersion of knowledge to the community through bengal chamber of commerce so that it is easily available attractive affordable solution to many people who will one day grow old will have prostatic problem will not require a knife will need not require ventilations or not be destined to death because of complications it works in prostatic large cancer so this is a large prostate 500 g there is no surgery available in this world which can remove this prostate but the only one that is embolizations large prostate copd diabetic 90 years catheter like pores ejection fractures so these are the people who will benefit from this technique so ladies and gentlemen it is not one day maybe in day one for many people who are suffering from this problem for very very uh, disturbing good quality of life so one day or day one you decide thank you very much for your kind attention thank you dr hajra so it was completely a different area which i'm sure that uh, many of us may not have any experience or in that way any knowledge about this particular procedure it sounds extremely innovative this technique um, if if can be popularized and if uh, people other people can be trained including myself will be very grateful prakash and uh, it the knowledge has to be disseminated the skill has to be shared and the need to be uh, taught, uh, taught trained and taught i'm sure it will be uh, we can have some discussion later on so don't uh, go away stay back meanwhile may i uh, call dr dilip kumar uh, to talk to us on his topic dr dilip kumar is a director of cath lab of medica group of hospital and uh, he is going to talk to us uh, about uh, some t- technology and intervention technology uh, in in uh, in, uh, in cardiovascular system particularly the aortic valve replacement the tavr which is a, a new modality of valve surgery without any knife so dr dilip is going to educate us on uh, transcatheterotic valve replacement we have some experience in our hospital and i'm going to i'm sure that he is going to share some of those cases thank you very much dilip all yours Dilip go ahead start
Okay, let's start. We can see. We can see your slide. Go to show and start talking. Slide show. Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me here, and uh, we heard uh, you know wonderful uh, lectures. And what better could be a topic uh, than transcatheter valve replacement to speak on uh, on this platform, health tech platform, as Tower is a glaring example of uh, advancements in medical engineering and technology. So transcatheter aortic valve replacement, the word used in, uh, which is used in the US, and the same technology is used in Europe as transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So they mean same, and uh, essentially it is uh, replacing the cardiac valve, the aortic valve, uh, without putting knife on the patient's chest. So we obviously don't put knife, but we use pictures, the needles, to uh, make some holes, and through this hole, we take the catheters up and we take the device down in the heart and you know, implant it at the proper position. So we can see the aortic valve here. Uh, this is the source, uh, you know, uh, heavily calcified valve. So as we age, uh, there is a calcium deposition which happens uh, on aortic valve. And when this calcium deposition becomes so much that it starts obstructing, obstructing the flow across the aortic valve. And finally, it leads to a pressure gradient of around uh, more than 64 peak and 45 mean, then we call it a severe aortic stenosis. And the valve orifice area of the valve, if it comes less than one centimeter square, then also we call it severe aortic stenosis. And uh, when severe aortic stenosis patients become symptomatic, then the decline in the survival is, is really, really rapid. So what we call uh, two, three and five years. So if the patient has dyspnea, uh, uh, with aortic stenosis, he is going to die in two years. Mean of two years, he is having uh, he is having syncope. Then he is going to die in three years. And if he is getting anginal symptoms with severe aortic stenosis, he is going to die in five years. So this is the this is uh, what we see a very steep decline in the survival. So we have to work in this two to three years to salvage these patients. Transcatheter aortic valve. Uh, Essentially, it was designed and conceptualized to, uh, for those patients who were surgery, surgically inoperable. So surgically turned down patients who were waiting to die. Uh, on these patients, initially, the transcatheter aortic valve was you know, tried. And uh, now we have got two kind of valves. One is uh, balloon expandable and second is uh, balloon uh, self-expandable valves. And when we do TAVI, we take care of, uh, we always see the uh, groin vessels, what we call femoral arteries. Uh, which should be good enough to take the she uh, to, to take the device, and we can negotiate this device up to the uh, aortic level. We also see the central vessels, which comes from the aortic arch. And if the calcium is calcium burden is high, if the patient has a previous history of stroke, then we have to take care, like we have to put some filters, and then we have to do TAVI. This is the first description of a uh, uh, valve switched in a stent animal model in 1992 by Henning Anderson. And obviously, it encountered a lot of problems, but it also gave us an idea that these things are feasible. And uh, first, in man, in human, uh, transplantation of the cardiac valve uh, uh, tower was done on 16th April 2002 by Professor Alan Cribier. This patient, was, uh, the tower was done on compassionate ground. The patient uh, was surgically turned down by four hospitals, he was waiting to die. I think mean age of, mean, uh, you know, survival of the patient was only 21 days. So they were expecting this patient to die in the next two, three weeks. And then he got an approval for use of his, uh, you know, uh, transcatheter valve on a compassionate basis. He did it and uh, and patient survived and then began the story of Tower. And it, is, it has become a success story and it is going uh, with a huge success. So. This is uh, Dr. Krivia joined hand with uh, Edwards company and they designed a valve which got CA approval in 2007 by the initial studies, some good reports. And then uh, the uh, core valve came in picture and 2011, the, there was a FDA approval for Edwards Sapiens. And nowadays we have got our own Indian My Valve and Hydra valves, which are really promising. And I hope the success story of Indian valves will be, will be as great as Indian scenes. So my valve and hydra valve, especially hydra valve, is, it looks very promising. The cost and the design of the valve looks, uh, you know, it gives a lot of hope. So we are now uh, working with the new generation devices, which can be negotiated through only 14 French sheets. And uh, the newer valves have got high flexibility, 
They, they have got easy, easy coronary access in case there is a coronary occlusion after this de uh, deployment of the device. There uh, is optimized hemodynamics and there is re reduced conduction abnormalities. You can see no flaring in the lower margin of the stent device. So it reduces the conduction abnormalities and chances of pacemaker becomes less. So these are some uh, new uh, advancements in the valve technology. They are also uh, better seen fluoroscopically and uh, they can be recaptured. If the position is not correct, then we can recapture it and redeploy it. So a lot of safety parameters are there. Uh, it can be uh, negotiated through 14 French devices, 14 French sheets. Uh, uh, so the uh, complication rate has really, really gone down. And this is what is uh, reflecting uh, in clinical practice. The tower cases has surpassed uh, surgery and it has passed a quarter million mark in US. And this is happening only with a uh, majority of the cases being done on high and intermediate surgical risk patients. And although the FDA has given clearance for uh, use of these devices in low risk patients, but still the, uh, the penetration in low, low risk is very less. So we can all imagine the situation and all low risk patients will be undergoing tower, then what kind of uh, market for in this technology would be in coming years. So when we plan a you know TAVI device with TAVI implantation, the CT CT angio and the CT scan evolution uh, is uh, is the cornerstone, and we we uh, it's a basic principle. We measure the aorta, we measure the aortic valve, we measure the femoral arteries, we measure the uh, coronary heights, and this is how we get a picture. Uh, it will exactly tell us the, how much the annulus diameter, how much the annular perimeter, and then we divide the, decide the you know sizes of the valve. It, this, it tells us how much uh, the, hi the height of coronaries are from the annulus. If it is more than 12, we are really uh, fairly uh, comfortable. And uh, if the femoral arteries are more than 5.5 millimeter, then the high chances that uh, there will be no complication in the peripheral vessels. So even though we have seen the CT angio, uh, the uh, femorals, we image it again in the cath lab to uh, see it again. There is a, it, 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 we have to puncture a disease-free state. Uh, you know, place and it has to be in common femoral artery, not in the you know SFA, because the common femoral is a has a bigger diameter, and when we puncture it, uh, we can take our device safely, and then we take the confida wire in. Uh, you can see you can see a pigtail in the aorta, and then a temporary catheter which spaces the heart while we deploy the uh, you know uh, tabi. Before we take the uh, the transcatheter wall down, we dilate the aortic valve uh, with zoomed balloon, and it basically it uh, enhances and you know betters the hemodynamics. It it uh, kind of uh, uh, clears some of the calcium. It can uh, breaks some of the calcium. The heart the valve is getting dilated so that we can take down our uh, transcatheter valve, and then the valve is negotiated, and it is placed after we see that. Uh, the height of the valve where we're deploying is appropriate, should not be low. Then it, cause, it can cause the conduction abnormalities. If it is high, then chances of embolization is there. If there are the chances of coronary occlusion uh, will be there. So we see there are, there are different ways to make that uh, the height of the uh, deployment is correct. Uh, what we call the cuspal bicuspal view, cuspal overlap view, or we make a view where all these three uh, sinuses are in one plane, and then we can decide the basically the depth of the implantation. This is how the device looks like once we uh, place a TAVI and uh, this uh, aortic injection reveals there is a, no, a very minimal AR which is very good, uh, you know, acceptable the coronaries are flowing. So this is a wonderful device technique and that's why uh, you can appreciate in 2019 tower volume in the US was around 72,000 and uh, all forms of SAVRs, surgical aortic valve replacements were uh, something around 57,000. So you can appreciate it's not only surpassed the surgical aortic valve, uh, you know, surgeries, but it has surpassed by a great margin, something like 15,000 patients in a year. In Europe, in uh, EU also, the uh, trend is same. Uh, in 2019, in EU, total of 40,000 towers happened in Europe. But look at the figures from India. In India, TAVI procedures are currently not even 0.5% of severe cases. In the US and Europe, where TAVI has surpassed the surgical numbers, 
we are struggling around 0.5% of surgical cases this is really pathetic so the what are the challenges why we are not able to pick, you know uh, catch up with the surgical valves so the basic problem is the cost and the reimbursement policy yesterday only we were discussing about a simple device called uh, oct what dr chalur rahman you know showed us uh, elegantly and many of the uh, you know schemes gives a cost of uh, surgical re reimbursement of 30000 uh, indian rupees and the cost of a catheter is 90000 so how can one perform these uh, you know uh, techniques and uh, the refinements the advancements in technology uh, how can we use these devices so reimbursement policies have to be uh, readdressed cost uh, we are very hopeful that with the uh, advent of hydra wall and indian valves i think the cost will come down and will will uh, will be able to match up with uh, our european and us colleagues in coming years uh, second problem is acquiring proficiency in tower so obviously if we are trained if we can't do tower uh, you know uh, maybe 10 15 in a year we will be becoming less proficient so what is happening with all indian most of the indian operators although they are trained Uh, they have enough exposure but still uh, the, the 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 rates of tavi should be increased to make to keep everyone uh, the, the same uh, you know uh, you know technically sound some anatomical factors are there our indian populations are shorter in height we have a, uh, you know lesser body surface area but they, they hardly matters when it comes to number of towers and the uh, maybe success as well so as compared to potential 2 lakhs 81000 patients who require tower in india we are doing tavi in only 600 patients in a year so from 2 lakhs 80000 we are doing only 600 cases we are still majority you know you can see the number of patients who are getting deprived of this brilliant you know technique and technology and treatment so let's promise let's let's work on the promise this tower has to be passed on to the indian patients in reality it should not be cruel as we are right now it should be as promised as we see in us and europe we have the infrastructure we have the team but the awareness for the tavi has to increase the common you know population should know about the tavi and and then the government schemes the cost factor everything we design so that we can pass on the best benefits to the patient thank you thank you a lot thanks a lot for the patient hearing thank you dilip that was really wonderful so uh, it's a great presentation so we finished all all of our uh, talks of the session but i think we need to discuss some of, some of the topics so may i start with dr shubhanan roy are you uh, there dr roy yes yeah so i think your presentation was simply excellent my only question which i have i'm sure that you know please uh, everybody should participate it is a very free kind of discussion you talked a lot about calcification uh, uh, calcium breaking of coronary arteries by rotablation what about if you have calcium in the peripheral arteries like very lot of you know we have we see patients of calcium in the patients with calcium in the peripheral arteries so of the calcium is really very critical is there any role of rotablation in peripheral artery calcification or if not what are the options we have So no, there is only one problem of uh, uh, rotational atherectomy in uh, peripheral arteries the peripheral arteries are usually very large you know uh, the usually the most of the calcium what is seen in the peripheral arteries is, is in the leg arteries particularly in the superficial femoral artery where the arterial diameter is uh, more than 6 mm so as our uh, knowledge goes the bar to artery ratio should be at least 0.6 in that case we need a have a hugely a huge size bar which is uh, not very easy to run through an i mean coronary artery now it is ivl is being used with a lot of success in uh, peripheral arteries and uh, that is one of the um, uh, exciting uh, paradigms of uh, coronary artery, i mean calcified arteries in peripheral uh, vasculature and also dca the directional coronary arterectomy was Mm, uh, once upon a time was used in coronary and it was again it died its death in coronaries but it resurfaced in the peripheral arteries and it shows a good amount of uh, um, uh, success in peripheral arteries so particularly 
because of the larger size of the arteries and the huge calcium burden, maybe the IVL and DCA would be better than rotational arthrectomy in the peripheral arteries. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Prakash Hajra, would you, would you like to add something to what, whatever Dr. Swanana said? Yeah, if this shockwave, uh, DCA, then cutting balloon, then you have uh, this long balloon, which is like a high pressure balloon, and uh, works. And uh, sometimes uh, you have to have both the facilities, like uh, even smaller arteries, rotile work, as he has mentioned, below the knee. But superficial femoral artery, most of the time, we use uh, uh, the shock ape, we can use shock ape, but previously we used to use atherectomy. I agree fully that sometimes it's very difficult, but you can leave them alone or you can send them for surgery if you're not able to open these calcifications. They but even, su even yeah. surgery could be difficult, isn't it? Because if they the surgery open it, he may not be able to put a graft uh, be, you know, beyond that because it's a calcified artery. My question is that, you know, sort of this innovative industry or technology is not coming up with something much more advanced, much more sophisticated technique to deal with this uh, calcium breakage? I, uh, I, I, for the timing, uh, I do not know anything new beyond uh, shockwave or laser. And uh, But beyond shockwave laser, I'm sure uh, there are some drugs which can decalcify uh, the bed protein inhibitions, PCSK9, good sugar control, lifestyle modification, stop smoking, rivaroxaban. So these are the polypharmacy. Excellent. Take care. Coming back to Dr. Abdul Rahman's uh, presentation, it's a great presentation, especially for this kind of health tech meeting. Only thing, Dr. Rahman, uh, we question you talked about IVAS, talked about OCT and FFR. I'm just wondering, do you, can we have a technology which is unique to have all the facilities in the same, same sort of technique, like called hybrid technique, hybrid image technique? I'm sure there is one hybrid technique which can do both OCT and IVAS. Uh, any comment on that? Anyone from the panel? Dr. Rahman first, maybe Dr. Hajar, Dr. Shivanandre, even Dilip, you can also suggest. No, okay, thank you. I think so. this is a great uh, thought. Uh, and suppose uh, we have an integrated coronary angiogram and coronary integrated FFR. That is the important tools. That is during the coronary angiogram, we can see the severity of the coronary, and, uh, severity of the coronary artery, exactly what is going on. And integration of the, on the same panel, the integration of the IVAS and the FFR is there, but it is uh, uh, there on the same board like that. But three integration, I don't know that FFR, OCT, and IVAS, maybe some companies coming up, the three company on the same, uh, maybe other panelists can give the answer for that, that whether there is a um, combination of the three OCT, IVAS, and FFR. Uh, Prakash, you have any, any uh, idea? Uh, about I think uh, it's a very great uh, thought. DIT, double imaging technique, DIT, is already there in Brazil and it originated from Brazil. Now it is available in many European countries. Seeing is believing. Whatever you speak, people will not believe it. But if you can show something, their calcium, their luminal narrowing and disappearing narrowness, you can show their cholesterol, there's lipids or the cholesterol getting deposited, getting, getting vanished with the therapy. Uh, compressed with a stain or absorbable strain, which stain is vanishing. These are OCTs plus IVAS, and this DIT is also taking a new shape in industry. But these are again costly. But smaller catheter, the problem is if you combine this technology, the size of the catheter will be more on the higher side, and uh, that is the only flip side. But I'm sure with the technique uh, improvement, the size of the catheter will come down. And we'll have uh, more and more kind of uh, this DIT in India in near future. Can I, can I have a point here? Can I have a point here? Yeah, yeah. A very important point. A very in interesting and exciting question. First of all, in a coronary artery, you need to know whether the, your vision is significant or not. There comes the you know role of uh, physiology. Next is the anatomy, how it looks like, whether there is calcium, whether uh, your artery is open, etc. etc. You see that the physiology, you do not require a lot of things nowadays. Even the computers have shown that from the, uh, uh, if, you, if you count the TIMI uh, uh, flow, a TIMI frame count, and you, will, you can be easily, from an angiogram, you can easily assess whether the artery lesion is significant or not. Exactly. Is I'm, so I'm so happy that you said, I think the Philips company has come up with some software in the cat, inside the cat lab, isn't it? 
Yes, it, it, it can be done in the inside the cath lab and also it can be done beautifully in CT scans. Oh. You get a CT, CT angiogram with a CTS FFR. And the, the, this will show that you have a very significant lesion in the coronary arteries. So you need not bother about the physiology. You have already got it. The problem is I have, I have a very excellent idea. I mean, experience that I want to share. Then in 2000, maybe in 1990, I went to gym. And there, a young guy showed an optical fiber. When he placed an optical fiber inside the coronary artery and showed that wonderful pictures of the lumen. And that is the basis of OCT, you know. That guy is one of the pioneers to show that what an optical fiber can do. And see, that is the mother of invention. If we can innovate that, and if we can show that an optical fiber is placed inside the coronary artery and a computer was used to, you know, uh, uh, just to record the visual, visualization, an OCT was born. And you see that the, the cost is, and I, I, I'm answering Dilip's question, the cost is fab fabulous, but if we can invent and if we can translate this, finally, every one of us had some, you know, innovation, innovative ideas in the, in our day-to-day uh, -day life, but we cannot translate this because okay. we do not have the association like that. Yeah, we need to develop that association. Kind of facilities. I think you are so right. And I just reminded me, you know, this chap, uh, CT coronary, C CT angiogram, it actually started with, if you all remember, EBCT, electron beam CT. And the chap who started was Stephen Bakker. He, uh, he was with me when I was at Dubai and I went from Hyderabad to Dubai. And he was with me and he spent some time with me. Very young chap. And then he only focused on that from EBCT to CT angio to 64 to now it is, I think, 512 so advanced facility. So that is a kind of, because he was in that kind of environment to develop his innovative ideas, innovative technologies in reality. But meanwhile, Dilip, if you have some, uh, could you enlighten us about, you talk a lot about QFR. Dilip asked, discuss with me about QFR. Can you share your ideas about QFR, IFR, and, and FFR, those kind of things uh, from the technological point of view, Dilip? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great point, sir, and uh, it's a great area as well. So uh, when we use do FFR, a classical FFR, we have to give adenosine, we have to give, uh, uh, you know, do, uh, to take the patient again, you have to pass the FFR wire. So, but QFR is a replacement. There is a software and uh, the same angiographic pictures we can uh, lo load in this software. And uh, then we have to uh, see it in two different projections. And the machine calculates, depends on how the uh, contrast flow was there, coming depending on the frame rates. So in the frame rate, in the frame rate one, the contrast was something proximal LED in frame rate, uh, you know, 15, it reached mid LED. So how it behaved, how it, you know, the, 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 the flow of the contrast was. Depending on this basic principle, it gives us an idea that uh, the, the, the reason is significant or not. And can, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you highlight what uh, Dilip said? Uh, or QFR, IFR, so many. Uh, yeah, uh, this QFR is basically a software. You know, you take the angiogram, you take two orthogonal views at 90 degree. By frame rate, you can get the same FFR. And the validation is almost to the tune of 98% with IFR and or CTFFR. The problem with CTFFR is now that you have to transmit the data to San Francisco and Australia. By transferring this data, it takes time for the reporting very costly software and I lose the data. Now, you know, this uh, kind of double imaging, a double concept is like having binocular visions in human being. The so previously surgeon used to show us their dominance, their arrogance by having a monocular visions that whatever you see as a triple vessel disease can be reclassified as a single vessel disease. They may not need triple grafts or the grafts will occlude. So this new technology has proved that if you follow angiography by visualizations, by physiology, by some words, or anatomy, by some ultrasound or lights inside the coronary artery intercardiac imaging, many of the stents can be averted. Many of the complications can be averted. The surgical time can be shortened. The life can be good. The mortality can be reduced. The quality will improve. The surgical dominance is dying down. Many of these patients left men turned down surgically because of the comorbidities. Now we can fix their arteries by putting very thin, ultra thin, extremely thin stain with help of imaging. And the complication rate 
has come down from five percent to one percent by this improvement in technique, technology, and constant learning and digitalization of health and social media. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Abdulur. Can you just can you just further? I think this is a great thing that you said that with the imaging, your complication is less, your results are great. Even some of the patients who are otherwise surgical refusal can be accepted. Complex case. Abdulur, what is your comment? Uh, about the imaging status in Bangladesh at the moment, or even other countries, because you are involved in the BIT group, so I'm sure that you know that how the developing world, the South Asia region, is uh, taking these imaging facilities for patients. Actually, in, if you check in Bangladesh, the imaging was very bad, and you can see that Hello? the before coming to the Garimans to the BIT meeting, BIT meeting four or five years back. In I was was not used. Then first time the Gary means was come here and he demonstrated and motivated our doctors to do it. So we are the BIT and you are the on board that after that um, the imaging is penetrating in Bangladesh. It's still the penetration is far far less. I'm sure the imaging also less penetrated in India. Maybe the main reason is that. The uh, imaging and the imaging, like the OCT and IVAS, interpretation of the the main thing has to be the doctor should tra- train properly as a fellowship uh, when they got the fellowships because the interpretation is very difficult. So this is one of the important and it is the interpretation and translation into the procedure and uh, it is very sometimes difficult even at the uh, experience hands. We are facing a lot of the problem. That's why it has to be incorporated in the fellowship training programs. Number one, number two is the pricing is a big factor, and also the uh, uh, also we have to focus that which of the lesion has to be treated by the eye was an amazing, and uh, we also reproduce that it is not a costly. It is a cost effective that has to be proven to our colleague and also the patient. Because if the patient come back with a restenosis, if the patient come back with a set, then the expense will more, and patient will die. By if we you know, use the imaging like IVAS and OCT, whatever model you have, then the outcome will be better, better than the long term longevity will be better, and the instant restenosis will be less, and the instant thrombosis will be less, and the patient uh, outcome will be better. If you can translate in this way in the uh, among the doctors community, at patient community. And also, we have to be covered up by the insurance coverage. That's also important. In Bangladesh, we have no insurance coverage. That's main limitation of in Bangladesh. I'm not sure that India the imaging is also covered by the India or not. I'm not sure. But look at Japan. The uh, it is full coverage. That's in Japan, 90 percent. In the USA, they wants to use it, but there is no there is no insurance coverage of the imaging. That's why it is 20 percent. And other thing that. There is less data that all of the patient will benefited by using the imaging long term data. There is no proven data like that, except in the complex situation like left main, like uh, bifurcation lesion, like CTO lesion. That is the superior. Other lesion is not a superior. So randomly use of the I was I will not recommend that. So these are the reason that we can address yes, that. Doctor Swanandre, just a quick comment from you. One, you know, he said about the insurance thing. I think in 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 India. It is already insurance. They they subsidize no for the health, like say central government, state government is already there. Yeah. I just would like to have your comment. Second is a comment about you, about you are using rotablation. Do you think the companies or industries are uh, sort of you know adopting a further advancement of the current uh, uh, technology of uh, rota, rota ray? <laughs> This is an amazing question. because uh, robin very knows very well that uh, there are certain modifications of rotational atherectomy which has not come into come in any india i don't know, know the reason uh, but still we are uh, lagging behind the us that rota pro has uh, started many years back perhaps in uh, us but still it has not come but uh, really th- does it matter i do not think that that really matters the main problem of rota is the rota wear they tried a le- lot with the rota wear they uh, tried to use uh, nitinol in rota wear but they failed you know 
this uh, that innovation fail actually the rota where the flimsy rota where that is the uh, success or that is the weakness of rota no rota no, no, actually i'll tell you very frankly now sort of myself with then bengal chamber and a health uh, committee actually we were trying to work with iit so if you could give that uh, give us some idea in, in this session in a in a one minute time so we can actually share with our iit colleagues through bengal chamber and take you also as a as an advisor for for, for some kind of project if, we, if it can be designed a quick uh, comment about it basically you know uh, the most important comment should be i mean most important uh, area sh- should be we should develop is the imaging we need to have our own imaging technique as we have come out with valves it has reduced the cost from 17 lakhs to now it is 10 lakhs we need to develop our imaging technique yes. and if, if somebody could develop a what's uh, oct from a uh, or from an optical fiber why don't we develop that we need to uh, we have a very brilliant people in iit so i invite everybody to come and to you know think over it so that we develop our imaging without imaging our angioplasty will be half done excellent i'm going to take this point maybe we can discuss in our health committee meeting and i, will... I have to leave uh, for another meeting yes. yeah thank you because thank you, you have any question on prostate just no just before uh, just before we leave just yes just any question to prakash on prostate because i don't know anything i can only share one experience of mine there is an periuterine sort of multiple vascular deformity so i did embolization and a patient came from bihar and she is doing very well this is only experience i have anybody in experience because this is a very innovative uh, technique no i have a small experience of uh, you know uh, prostatic artery embolization because in my hospital uh, it was it has been pra- practiced by dr ashok dhar and actually he has not uh, we have not done uh, prostatic embolization in uh, uh, parsi uh, prostates Uh, it, we did embolization in our, you know, prostatic bleedings when there is a huge bleeding from the prostate, or uh, this chemo, uh, in chemotherapy was given through the uh, prostatic artery. The pro- problem of I, what problem I, uh, you know, uh, I could see that prostatic arteries are not fixed arteries. They come some from middle rectal artery, sometimes from lot of lot of other arteries too. If you look at the internal arteries, it is like a pace answer in us. The first branch is obturator. You know that you know we have both of us have shared them. One is excellent from anatomy point to excellent, outstanding. My guru. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point is, it is very difficult sometimes to you know fix up the artery in which from which artery it is coming out. If it is coming from the middle rectal artery, sometimes the rectum and anal canal may be damaged. That is the one you know uh, uh, fear I have. Uh, when uh, abnormal or when the main prostatic artery comes out from middle rectal artery, if it comes from the uh, other arteries like obturator and amalgam artery, sometimes, sometimes from the uh, uh, from the inferior gluteal artery, I I I I do not mind. Yeah, okay. Any comment? Any comment? Any comment? Yeah. Yeah. To obviate the difficulties, you have a CT angio now, excellent CT angio, hybrid lab. So when you're doing a angiogram, you just in, I mean inject the dye in the I mean iliac artery. You do the CT scan. That is a luxury. But if you have the prior CT scan, this is so obvious that we have only type four, type one, two, type four, four types of prostate artery. See, it's a very small educational thing uh, to learn. And uh, so I also didn't know anything about prostate. It was not my domain. So when I got the instant relief and the relief and the happiness of the people, the next void of urine, they feel so happy. It's so as if like they're having another orgasmic feel in eighty years. Excellent. I think before Prakash, just just hold for a minute or so. I take quick uh, questions from you because uh, uh, Dilip has presented nicely. Tower because last slide was a bit of depressing. For Indian thing because so many two hundred two hundred thousand people are waiting are in the waiting list. We are only doing so so small. What we should do? Maybe yourself, uh, Dr. Roy can give a comment about Indian scenario. Then I'll ask Dr. Uh, Abdulur to give a tower in Bangladesh scenario. First, yeah, the problem is the price and the pocket uh, and uh, the pain in having smaller uh, groin arteries. You know, these are the two most difficulties having tower in Indian subjects. now the cost of tabar therapy has come down there should be some ngos some uh, the central government should give some help and should be the restricted the accessories should be manufactured in india 
we can produce good dilator, good wear at very nominal price. And uh, these valves develop in India, but the accessories are costly. So everything is coming as a package. And this package can be reduced further with the help of the industry only. We cannot do much. We can give some ideas, as you have mentioned. But our engineers, our guys, should act on our ideas and should lead it forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is the scenario in Bangladesh? Bangladesh, we have only one or two tower, and uh, some of the people is from Bangladesh to go into the outside abroad, India especially, in the tower. Some of the people, uh, but uh, in Bangladesh, the tower is not uh, routinely done. The reason is that one thing is that patient, we have to make the confidence of the patient that tower could be done in our own country. That's most, most important. Number two is that the uh, the, the expense it is very expensive tool still Indian uh, the the valve is less expensive but the Indian valve has a limitation of the sizes I think so at present they have no so not really so many sizes and other thing is that that Prakash told that these I will add one thing that in the elderly patients and uh, people don't like to spend so much uh, so much money because the money is coming to the pocket because they have to spend this money for their children for a daughter marriage or education purpose but but 80 years is and uh, they don't like to put them additional amount of the money to these people so it is really um, it is uh, really bad to hear but it is reality because yeah. this money is coming from the um, uh, from the uh, from the own pocket, so there should be some coverage by the insurance somehow. We're but working. This is excellent. This is excellent. No, point. Huh. The point uh, I I must admit that uh, Absolute's comment is absolutely realistic and humanity humanitarian grounds. So and also I can tell you one thing, Ruvin. Very soon the valves will be affordable because. Huh. I have seen that it is coming down, and that people are trying to come, uh, you know, come with valves less than five lakhs. So, money will not be a problem. It is a mindset, yes. and also that is very very important. That in an elderly people do not want to, you know, uh, this thing uh, put money on elderly people because their life is right. it is right. very right. sad right. and. Uh, but so in, in the Western world nowadays, the surgeons are doing. They are, they are they are stopped doing surgery. They are learning cardiac catheterization. Exactly, <laughs> and also I have seen uh, neurological uh, neurosurgeons. They yes. are doing uh, neuro intervention. Agreed. In my hospital, there is a neurosurgeon who is doing neuro intervention. Excellent. So there is a change over. I think uh, Dilip, you have any comment on Tavar? Uh, what are your views? Dr. Subhan Rai and Dr. Abdul Ruman, uh, Dr. Abjadur told very pertinent. Maybe the golden days are waiting. So once we see Swasati and Ashman Bharat, kind of five, six lakhs, and then the cost becomes less than five lakhs, Agreed. it gets and then there will be a huge number of Tavi we will be able to do. I foresee this feature. Uh, I think it's it going to be you know, a, real, a you know, real world picture in coming years, next one, two years. I think we, we, we have taken all the comments, uh, and I'm sure that uh, this is a great session. I, we all agree, and I enjoy it personally. Every speaker really spoke so well, especially on the technical part of the talk, not exactly medical kind of talk that we doctors give. And is that medical jargons were not there, purely focused for the technical advancement technology in healthcare, befitting with the health tech, uh, fourth health tech of 2021. With that, I close the session. May I request Angana to take over the session? Angana, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dilip Kumar, Dr. Shubhanandri, Dr. Prakash Rajaran, Abdul Rahman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to be a very wonderful speakers and thank you all the audience who listened to us. Hopefully it will have some meaning towards you. Angana, please take over the session. Thank you, doctors. Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Shuvanan Ray, uh, Dr. Abzalul Rahman, Dr. P.K. Hazra and Dr. Dilip Kumar for joining us in the technology adoption of cardiovascular. Our next session would be technology adoption in immunology and rheumatology. It is scheduled at 8, 8 p.m. Uh, IST. So uh, you were requested to join us back at 8 p.m. No. IST for no. technology adoption in immunology and rheumatology. It would be chaired by Kanjaksha Ghosh, Dr. Professor Kanjaksha Ghosh, and would be co-chaired by our Dr. Robin Chakraborty. So join us back at 8 p.m. IST. Thank you. Thank you, Agana. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll see you all.